Hello, Burbankers, and welcome back to the Mike and Roy Show. Here we are uh, with our candidate videos, and we have uh, hopeful candidate, city council candidate Nick Schultz here with us today. And Nick, if you uh, will allow us, we'll get right to the questions. Oh, please, and thank you so much for having me today. Sure. I'm happy to be here. Great. We think it's important for the Burbank community to know the candidates, and this is one way we can do that. Right. Yeah, glad to have you here. Great. Uh, so right to it. The Burbank Airport plans to expand the terminal to 150% of its existing size. We know the plan is to replace the 14 gates with 14 gates, but with the expansion of the terminal, we are likely to see a dramatic increase in air and ground traffic. What are your thoughts on airport expansion at Burbank? Well, you know, when the voters passed Measure B in 2016 with Gosh, I want to say near 70% approval, if I'm recalling correctly. I mean, I think they expressed their will, you know, pretty clearly. It's time to upgrade the airport. It's going to be more accessible. It's going to be more seismically retrofit. But I do share your concerns about, you know, traffic and congestion and access to the airport. So what I would like to see is further investment in our mass transit options to get to and from Bob Hope Airport. You know, we've been talking a lot about high-speed rail coming through Southern California and Burbank being a central hub for that. I'd like to see a seamless and easy transition from high-speed rail to Bob Hope Airport so people can conveniently take that to get there. You know, in other cities, they're much more uh, invested in having, uh, you know, light rail and bus systems so that people aren't having to drive their car and park near the airport. So that's what I want to prioritize because while I do understand our airport needs an upgrade and it's time for that, I don't want to see it uh, become LAX, which which is a complete nightmare for anyone who tries to fly out of there, right? It's it's horrendous. So we do need to increase our mass transit options to and from there. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, police corruption, abuse, and systemic racism have been a major political issue around our country. How would you rate Burbank Police Department's record on these issues? You know, so I work as a prosecutor with the California Department of Justice. And so this is an issue that hits home to me because I, I live this, you know, every single day. You know, most of the law enforcement officers that I go to work with, you know, they're most of the time state and federal uh, law enforcement officials, although sometimes we work with the locals. And these are good people. You know, they put their lives on the line. They live in our community. They kiss their families goodbye every day. And they go out there and risk their lives if need be to make sure that we stay safe and our property is protected. But with all of that said, I think it's certainly high time that we have this conversation because clearly too many black Americans have lost their lives at the hands of police. And systemic racism is a problem that isn't, you know, confined just to Minneapolis. I mean, we have it every place, you know, we have it here too. So as far as how to tackle that, I would say we're pretty fortunate to the extent that Burbank Police Department has had a good relationship with the community. I think they have good police practices in place now that they're wearing body cams. I applaud city council for starting the process of reviewing the use of force policy, but I think there's a lot more that we could be doing. Use of force policy should really be a guide to our officers in uniform to make sure that they have a clear understanding of when particular tactics and weapons can be utilized. There should always be a requirement that all non and less lethal use of force options be exhausted before deadly force is used. I think we need a majority minority police commission and an expanded police commission because that's how you start to repair that relationship between these communities of color that have been disproportionately impacted by police abuse and misconduct. Um, I also think that we need more implicit bias training, and that's not so much confined just to Burbank police, but that's to every city employee and official. We all have bias, and part of overcoming that systemic racism that we see in our daily lives is acknowledging that the bias is there and educating ourselves and becoming more aware of it. And lastly, um, while Burbank PD has done a lot of good things, I also think there's an opportunity here to invest further in uh, you know, rehabilitative and preventative programming. Simply put, I don't think that every problem Problem that an officer is going to encounter on the streets of Burbank needs to be answered with an officer with a gun and a badge. I think that they have a very particular skill set and we need them investigating burglaries and doing car chases if the case might be and investigating serious violent crime. To the extent that we can invest in other options that allow them to do their job and put other folks with resources and expertise on the streets to deal with our homeless, folks with addiction problems, folks with mental health problems, I think that's part of the solution. Thank you. Exceedingly high salaries throughout our city staff have been a major concern for Burbank residents. Mike and I have talked a number of times at council about this issue. Staff disagrees and argues that their salaries are in line with those in comparable communities and essential in order to retain employees. Our research uh, and the high turnover rate among staff dispute that. What are your thoughts on staff salaries? 
Well, before I get to that, I would like to say that after today, I'd absolutely love to chat with both of you about your research and your findings. I think that education is a powerful tool. But on this issue, again, I think that I offer a bit of a unique perspective. I am a public sector employee. I work for the state of California and the Department of Justice. And I'll tell you that the, under, the, the approach I take with it is this. I went into that line of work not to make a lot of money. I could have worked in the private sector, and I could have made a much higher salary in a private firm. And I understand that the people that work in public service do so not for the money, but because they care about the mission. In my case, it's about protecting Californians from threats of fraud or violence or human trafficking or public corruption, as the case might be. So I think that you know it's sort of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we have to have competitive salaries that do attract good people. I genuinely believe you get what you pay for, especially in public service. You know, you do have to have competitive salary and benefits. On the other hand, when we're talking about these comparable communities, we really got to make sure that we're using an accurate benchmark to measure ourselves. And I'll give you one example. I was talking with um, representatives from Burbank Firefighters Local 778, and they were telling me, well, when we have our salaries compared, uh, Riverside, California is used as a benchmark that we're measured against. And look, that doesn't make any darn sense. Cost of living is very different in Riverside, California versus Burbank, California. I'm not saying that we should be measuring ourselves against the city of Los Angeles. That's really an entirely different thing. But we should be looking at Glendale and Pasadena. And at the end of the day, we have to make sure that while we are offering competitive pay and benefits, that we're also guarding against these windfall salaries. You know, you don't come to work in public sector work, you know, to make a three or four or five, you know, hundred thousand dollar, you know, salary, it should be enough to hopefully allow you to live in the community that you're serving. Of course, but we—it's all about nuance and balanced approach. So I, I think that you know, if I have the good fortune of being elected, I look forward to sitting down with the city manager, looking over the salary and budget, and I think there's going to be a lot of tough decisions that have to be made over the next couple of years. I, we're just beginning to see the depth of this crisis and the financial fallout from it. So I, I look forward to rolling up my sleeves and getting to work. Great, thank you. Um, Roy and I raised our children in the Burbank schools and mm -hmm. we've been very active with the schools in the district. Um, the Burbank Unified School District has been attempting to pass a new parcel tax to support the financial needs of our schools. Burbank voters did not pass these ballot measures in our last two elections. Are you in favor of a new parcel tax to support our schools? You know, that's a tough one because I was a proponent and an advocate for both Measure QS and Measure I. I volunteered on the Measure I campaign. So it's bittersweet for me to say, but the voters have weighed in twice now, and I think they've made their voice fairly clear on this issue. So, you know, on top of the, so there's kind of two issues I have with it. On the pragmatic approach is if we were to have another parcel tax, what would be different about it this time? What makes us think that this time we could get it over the hump and pass? But the other problem is that we're not operating in the same environment that we were even in March. We're in the midst of an unprecedented global pandemic with no end in sight. I mean, we don't know if or when a vaccine is going to be created. The economic fallout is still being determined. I mean, there are so many shops right here, as you guys know, that are closing down for good. You know, Moore's Delicatessen, for example, it's gone. Uh, there are jobs that are leaving our city. There are renters and commercial tenants that are unable to pay the rent. Um, and quite frankly, as we start looking at these colder winter months ahead of us, I don't think it's uh, unsurprising that we might see an uptick in cases. So my point in saying all of that is that I don't think that now is the time to be adding a tax burden to anyone when so many are just barely able to make it. With that said, I do think that schools are a high priority. You know, that's why my wife, Allie, and I chose Burbank in large part because of the quality of the public education. And so what I think we need to be doing, and I'll give you an example, when I decided to run a few months ago, I sat down with Shar Tabit, the uh, clerk of the school board, and I had a chance to talk with her. And I said, look, what do you think could be done? What could we do to ease the burden on the school board as there are some very deep and personal cuts that are going to have to be made? And she had a lot of great ideas. She was saying, well, you know, the city could help us in partnering to take over the cost of some ancillary education related programs like mental health services. That's something that I would like to explore. I don't think that we can allow our schools to fail, but I also understand that people are hurting right now and they just don't have an extra few dollars in their pockets to be absorbing any sort of burden right now. When we get through the other side of this pandemic, it will hopefully be a different world and we can continue to have these conversations, but right now everything needs to be focused on keeping people in their homes and getting them through this crisis. Okay, good. Thanks. And on a side note, like Pasadena, with their sales tax, we did pass the sales tax here in Burbank. Right. And it would have been great in Burbank, and we talked about this at city council meeting, can't we work to get in the school district, could yes. we have worked together with the city council and get a portion of that sales tax increase now telling us 
with the highest, uh, I believe, in the U.S. Mike, mm -hmm. uh, no. sales tax. Couldn't some of that? And it's a shame. I know. It's it's too bad, but. Uh, we'll have to see what the future brings, yeah. right? Point well taken, though. And that's the kind of long-term planning and strategic thinking that we need to be guarding against because I, I'm sorry to go off no, script no, no. here, but, you know, the reality is is that the people that sit on the dais need to constantly be thinking about worst-case scenarios. You know, a, you know, a pandemic, uh, an earthquake, you know, wildfires ravaging. These are becoming par for the course here in Southern California. So we have to start preparing for that rainy day and thinking long-term, and I view that as a missed opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, we have to agree that. Just way. real quick, watch your feet on the tripod below. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's okay. Uh, yep. Okay, Nick, so uh, going on here, um, our speaking of neighboring communities like Pasadena, and he, they are one of them, uh, that one of the neighboring cities that do charge developers a fee per unit as they build, that those fees are much, much higher than those charged here in Burbank. These development impact fees, or DIFs, could greatly benefit our community but our city council and staff are very hesitant to raise the fees to the level of our neighbors. What are your views on DIFs? And do you feel our low fees are encouraging developers to replace much of our affordable housing with units that are uh, just too expensive for most of the current residents here in Burbank? Well, development impact fees are an incredibly vital part of ensuring that when new projects come into our community that we have the funds to add all the infrastructure investments that we need to make, whether it's water, sewage, uh, transportation, police, fire. And now I was, uh, you know, doing a little bit of research the other day on this issue, and I saw back in February when council was taking this up. I mean, we, our DIFs are much, much lower than Pasadena and Glendale. Now, to be fair, I understand both sides of the issue, because right on the one hand, you're saying, well, because it's lower, it offers an incentive for developers to come in here and, and select Burbank as the site for whatever it is that they want to build. On the other hand, when they're so much lower, we're missing the opportunity for much needed revenue for these sorts of projects. So I, I honestly like like to think that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think we can do a bit of both. I think that our DIFs are very low, and I think that they could be raised so that we have more funny to, money to fund these sorts of investments that we need. At the same time, that doesn't mean we need to absolutely match on par, you know, the DIFs in Glendale and Pasadena. We could raise them quite a bit substantially because we're several thousand dollars below our neighboring communities. Right. So, I mean, we yeah. could raise them a little bit and still be competitive and still be that attractive place for Burbank uh, to be a, a source of development of new housing and new projects. I just think, again, we got to be thinking a little bit more strategic about this. Thank you. Thanks. Um, our city council imposed what we, Roy and I, and a lot of residents of Burbank see as restrictions on our ability to publicly address and engage with our elected officials and city staff. One of these restrictions was the elimination of final public comment at the close of every city council meeting. Mm -hmm. Would you support us in our effort to have final orals reinstated at city council meetings? Yes, absolutely. And I'd go a step further. Um, you know, having people come down to city hall, it is an opportunity for them to be involved in city government, but it's also incredibly inconvenient for people that are raising families and have child care issues and are working jobs. I think that we need to increase opportunity for public comment. And, and by the way, I can't tell you how many meetings I've gone to, and most of the council members don't respond to much of the public comment anyway. And as you know, things come up in the course of a meeting that you might want to respond to at the end, and you're deprived of that opportunity. So that's one part of the problem. But I also think that our city council members need to do a much better job of getting outside of city council and talking with their constituents in the community. One very simple, concrete idea, it's not my own. I mean, many other, many other elected officials do this, but having regular town hall meetings or just meetups at local businesses and making yourself available to people that live here and meeting them on their turf and answering questions and pointing them in the right direction. So much of that is relationship building that I just think has been missing from City Hall. And if you do that, you're opening the doors for local government participation and we can't lose sight of the fact that for most people, this is the most contact they will ever have with their government in any form other than maybe jury service in the court system. So being there in the community, being that friendly face and actually coming to them because the last thing I'll say, and I know we have some other questions, so I'll get on to it, but, you know, it's incredibly intimidating for your first time to walk in there and to stare up at all those faces looking at you, some of which aren't even paying attention to you, it seems, half the time. So, <laughs> yes, we, we can yeah, I think there's something to be said for this, right? Guys being able to have a conversation on the other side of a table and being able to have the back and forth, that's what I think I bring to the table. Great. Uh, Mike, I want to go off script with, with your permission, Nick, too. Sure. I want to thank our friends here at the VFW, and I haven't yet in their other videos, but for them, they opened up our, their hall 
to us today to do these interviews. Um, the Breach supporters obviously have the process, uh, and they're just great folks here at the VFW. So if you haven't visited here before, to our friends in Burbank, uh, they, they, when they're when they're back and reopened, it's a wonderful social hall. And remodeled, and, they recently yep. remodeled. Mm -hmm. and I think they're open for events. You can rent the hall. And when do you yeah. see the new yeah. sign out front, the new neon sign? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, a good friend of ours, a re rehabilitated. A really close friend. Yes. In fact, oh, that's incredible. Helping us today. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, a big, big shout out and a thank you to our friends at the VFW. So, uh, so Nick, uh, as we had warned you, we had a few <laughs> questions that we did like, with the other candidates, all the same questions, but we didn't give you these ahead of time. So with your permission, we're going to try Please. to... Uh, Try to surprise you here a little bit. Okay. Before I go, did you want me to answer number seven here? No, we'll get there. That's the most important question of all. Okay, I'll be ready. <laughs> Dang, we're going to finish with that. <laughs> that's right. Okay, so these yeah, are in person. Over. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Many Burbank residents feel that we have a problem with overdevelopment yeah. that may be permanently changing the character of our community or our city. What are your thoughts on overdevelopment here in Burbank? You know, here is what I think. I think we obviously have a housing crisis in, short, in Southern California, and that comes as a surprise to very few. We need to add more affordable housing options to the city of Burbank, but we need to be careful in how we do it. You know, people either grew up or chose to live in Burbank for a particular reason. I don't want to feel like I'm living in downtown LA, and I don't think many of you do either. I, I don't want an eight-story development right next door to my single-family home, for example. With that said, I think that one of the impediments to any sort of growth uh, has always been that, look, the people in our rancho neighborhood where I live or in our hillside community are wary of you know, putting in a big box store that might crowd out small business. So here's what I think. I think there's an opportunity to add affordable housing, to add more ground space for new businesses to come in if we do it in the right areas. And one area in particular I'm focused on is the Golden State District. You know, this is an area that I think is prime for revitalization if we do it the right way. And here's what I envision. I envision mixed use development where we have new ground floor space where there's more opportunities for new businesses, new locally owned businesses to come in and with that new jobs for creation. I know it doesn't go exactly to your question, but one of the things I've been campaigning on is this idea idea of the Burbank Economic Recovery Task Force. I won't spend more than 20 seconds on it, but the idea is that we're bringing together the entertainment and production studios, our small businesses, our retailers, with organized labor and community leaders to design and execute a comprehensive growth and redevelopment plan for the city. Because you can't treat Burbank like you can the rest of LA County. Our local economy is unique in that we are not only, only reliant but beneficiaries of the entertainment and production studios, which have shut down almost completely. Um, but back Back to your question. So I envision opportunities where there's more business coming into Burbank and hopefully more minority and women owned businesses and part of what the BERT's going to do is reevaluate the barriers to doing business in the city of Burbank. Now above there we can have more housing but if we're going to talk about affordable housing we also have to understand that there's different forms of affordable housing. You can't use one blanket term to talk about very low income and low income and moderate income and even market level housing. So we have to have more of that. The other thing I would add is that Burbank has always prided itself on our parks and open spaces. I mean, we have riches galore. I mean, we have the Chandler bike path. I love walking in Johnny Carson Park every night, for example. So let's actually build these communities up to where people want to be. Let's create new neighborhoods and new living opportunities without destroying what makes us unique, what brought so many people here and keeps people here. So that's my overall sort of big picture view on the future of Burbank. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, if you're elected to city council, the safety and quality of life of Burbank residents should be a priority. Yeah. What would you consider to be your number one priority first uh, as a city council member? Well, I think I partly touched on it. I mean, economic recovery has got to be number one right now. I mean, so many people are at risk of losing their homes. I won't repeat myself, but everything I just talked about, the birth, having, adding more opportunities for folks to be able to live and work in Burbank is going to be crucial. But beyond that, I, one thing I want to go back to that I mentioned earlier in this interview was that pre preparation for a next disaster. I mean, we saw earlier this year what happens when the supply chain is threatened or interrupted. And so I think that city council really needs to be working not only with our businesses here, but with our, all of our planning staff to make sure that we're ready for the next one. Because again, we don't know how long this pandemic's going to last. We don't know if there's going to be an earthquake. We don't know what the future might hold. And I think that while what, what I have seen from city council is sort of a slow and reactive 
approach to handling this crisis. A lot of defer deference to what the Board of Supervisors are doing and looking to what other communities are doing. We got lucky in some ways. I think that we've had good leadership at the local, county, and federal level, but I don't think that we are through this crisis yet. And I think there's a possibility and a potential to get worse. And for that reason, I think we need forward-thinking planning, and we need people that aren't just looking at solutions here in Burbank, but also working our regional partnerships to making sure that every available resource and opportunity we're going to have in case it gets worse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago, I'm just telling you with this last question, mm -hmm. um, the Golden State specific plan mm -hmm. and your thoughts about that. Uh, so this ties in with that. Uh, okay. This next question. One of the best kept secrets in Burbank is the addition of a large Amazon oh. facility at the new Avion development right near the airport there, for those who don't know, on Hollywood Way. Why do you think this has been kept a secret and how do you feel this was a, will affect the surrounding neighborhood and the entire community? What do you think will happen? to the new Avion development when the high-speed rail facility comes to that area, or that spot, really, it's where the right. situated Avion is. So, I mean, that's a great question. There's multiple parts, so I'll try to tackle it in the sense that I, I think makes the most sense. So, to the first question of why it hasn't been more discussed publicly, I, I really don't know. I think that it should. I think it's very important. It has the potential to change the character of that district, that neighborhood. So, I think it should be more readily discussed. What I would say about Amazon in general, and this kind of ties into why I'm running in the first place, why I felt like I needed to throw my name into consideration and be out here talking, is that so much of the conversation has been about how we get back to where we were. And so people are looking at Amazon and saying, more jobs, that's a great thing, right? It's going to bring jobs here to Burbank. Well, maybe, possibly, um, but that's not the focus of why I'm running. I don't think building back to where we were is going to be good enough. I knew a lot of people that were struggling even before the pandemic, working two or three jobs, still having a hard time paying the rent, not able to send their kids to school with new supplies, maybe not even able uh, to have health care you know, access. So I want to make sure that when Burbank adds an opportunity for new jobs, when either homegrown jobs pop up or someone else wants to bring jobs to Burbank, my primary focus is always going to be, are these new good paying jobs? Are they jobs with benefit? Do they provide access to health care coverage? You know, these need to be family friendly jobs because that is what makes Burbank so special. We're a community, you know, the people that own businesses here and work here live here. And so that's what we need to maintain about our future. And so when I see Amazon, you know, look, I've heard all the same criticisms and complaints that everyone else has, and I'm a little worried. I don't know that that really fits the future of what I see for Burbank, and I think that we need to be much more bold and proactive in not just recruiting new business opportunities, but making sure when they come in that they are uh, they're doing what we need them to do, and that is provide livable jobs with fair and competitive wages for the people that live here. Um, the other thing I would add is with high-speed rail, I mean, that's the million-dollar question. One of the reasons I zeroed in on the Golden State District is how uniquely positioned it is. It is where they envision bringing high-speed rail through Burbank. It also has unparalleled mass transit options, right, with Metro Rail and the bus system right there. I think that that district has incredible potential. The question is going to be how we tackle it in the years to come. And I don't think that a piecemeal approach of, well, we like this development project, or we might add this here. We really do need that long-term strategy and plan. And I know that they're starting that process up. I think next year we're going to learn a lot more about what they see being the future of the Golden State District. But I think it needs to be designed incredibly well with a lot of foresight. And the last thing I will say, because I know I'm going on a lot on this question, is that I'm many year, years younger, not only to the current council members, but to many of my colleagues who are running in this race. And what I tell people is this, I'm bright, I'm motivated, I have some good ideas, but most importantly, I intend to spend the rest of my life here with my wife, Allie. I'm gonna be here the next 30 years. So how Burbank to, uh, grows and responds to the challenges that we're facing right now is incredibly personal to me because my kids and you know hopefully my grandkids are going to either benefit from or hurt from the fact of what we do in the next four to 10 years. So that's, that's my thoughts on that. Yeah. That's great. That was a lot of questions wrapped into that. <laughs> that was a great yeah, question. Yeah. Good. Good job. Thank you. The number one question, the most important question, <laughs> the most difficult question to answer. Indians or Bulldogs? <laughs> well, of course I would say that we're so lucky to have two amazing schools. Oh, Don't worry, guys. Sorry. I'm going to answer it. Don't you worry. <laughs> Trust me. I, I'm, I'm not going to do a cop-out on this one. I will answer it. But of course, I have to say that we're so lucky to have two amazing public schools. We would agree. Yeah. Of course. However, there's always a winner in everything. Um, so I'm going to go with the fact that where we live in the Rancho, 
uh, if our if we had kids in high school tomorrow, they uh, they would be at Burroughs, so go red. <laughs> go red. Be committed. <laughs> we went red uh, with our kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Went through Burroughs, and uh, uh, but you're right. They're both great schools. We live in a great community, and yeah. thank you for being willing to oh, serve you, as a city council member. And all the best to you in the election. Thank you so much. And before we go off air, if I may, if anyone is watching and they want to know my position on something that wasn't asked, or if you want to reach out to me, if you have questions, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can go to nickforburbank.com. That's spelled N-I-C-K-F-O-R and the rest is burbank.com. You can send me an email through there and I'll do one better. You can call or text me directly. My number is 818-806-9392. Feel free to call or text and I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, would be honored to earn your support on November 3rd. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And we'll see you next time on, on the Mike and Roy Show. show.